What's up, friends? Hey, it's good to see you. I bring greetings from upstairs. The middle schoolers say hello. Question, movie people in here? Uh, favorite like movie series, extended series, multiple movies that all make up a series, what do we got? Heard Star Wars, Hunger Games, ooh. Harry, ooh, that's controversial in this place, but I like it. Toy Story, yeah, Will. Toy Story, uh, Dark Knight, good, good, good. Uh, what about Rocky? Like the OG Rockies and then the Creed movies? So, hey, if you, have you ever seen the first, I mean, the first Rocky came out in 1976. And, and in this movie, in this movie, Rocky Balboa, like kind of nobody, nothing boxer, gets an opportunity to fight Apollo Creed, world heavyweight champion. And so he starts training for this fight. And there's this iconic scene, like this training montage, two minutes of Rocky. And it's like, that, that song, Gonna Fly Now, is playing, like, ba da ba ba da ba and he's running through the rail yards, and he's running through downtown Philly, and he's, like, doing one-handed push-ups, and he's hitting the speed bag, and, and you get to the end of, like, this two minutes, and he's, like, yoked and shredded and, like, ready to fight Apollo Creed. And I, I saw a friend of mine uh, post on Instagram about how the first time he ever saw that movie and watch that scene, his initial reaction was like, I'm going to train like Rocky. And so he, he like goes into his room and he's trying to do one handed push ups and he's like running laps around his house, trying to get in shape and then gets into his bathroom and looks in the mirror and kind of like flexes and obviously looked nothing like Sylvester Stallone, like the actor who plays Rocky, who's juiced up and all, all sorts of rips, like, so disappointing, right? You, like, you can't get, you can't get strong, you can't get ripped, you can't see gains from, like, working out for one intense day, right? Like, it takes, like, kind of consistent training over time, meal prepping, you got to do it over and over and over again for a long time. You got to work for those gains, so why do we try to do that with our faith in Jesus? Tonight, we're wrapping up our series. It's called How to Win at High School. And I'm closing with a message that I call winning in the long run. Winning in the long run. I, I want to examine what it takes to build a strong faith. I want to examine what it takes to build a faith that's going to carry you when you are 28, when you are 58, when you are 88 years old. I would argue that when it comes to a life of following Jesus, a lot of you are trying to like rocky montage your way into following Jesus, into a vibrant and thriving faith. Maybe... Maybe you came with me to summer camp as a middle school student and the Holy Spirit like rocked your world. And if you know what firewalk is, maybe you wrote something on a popsicle and you threw it into that fire, some sin that you were so sick of dealing with. And you went home and like for a week, things were different. It was behind you. Like, like you were done. And then reality set in. And you're like back back to where you were. And maybe you're sitting here in high school now, several years later, and you were still there, and you're still stuck. But I also know, I also know that you desperately want to follow Jesus. You want to stay faithful. You want to conquer those sin patterns, those addictions that have been dominating your life. But you just feel stuck. My goal tonight as your pastor is to help you get unstuck. I want to give you a vision for what it could look like to be following Jesus when you are 88 years old. So if you remember one thing from tonight, I want it to be this, 
that winning in high school requires a long obedience in the same direction. Winning in high school requires a long obedience in the same direction. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 6 tonight. So get a Bible in front of you and meet me there. And when you're there, you're going to see that Daniel chapter 6 contains probably the most well-known Bible story in the entire canon. Somebody, what's the subheading say? Daniel chapter 6. Daniel in the lion's den. I mean, show of hands, without even looking at the text, who knows what happens in Daniel chapter 6? A lot of us. There's people who are, have never set foot in a church who know what happens in Daniel chapter 6, right? Daniel, he gets put into this position of power, like second most powerful dude in the whole empire. And his rivals, his political rivals get jealous. So they go to King Darius and they, they say, King Darius, you should make a law that anybody who worships any other god or any other person besides you, King Darius is going to get thrown into a den of lions. And Darius is like, where can I sign? And so he signs this thing into law. And Daniel, of course, faithfully follows God. And so his rivals catch him praying to God. And Darius is forced to throw Daniel into a den of lions. But just like what happened in Daniel chapter 3, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saved miraculously by God in the fiery furnace, an angel shows up in the den of lions and shuts the lions' mouths. They cannot eat Daniel, and so in the morning, Daniel's still alive. And Daniel's faith causes King Darius to praise God. But I don't think the point of this text is the lions. And so I want to draw our attention to some other aspects of this text. So look with me, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Here's what my Bible says. It says, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers, and because of Daniel's great ability... The king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officials uh, became, began searching for some fault in the way that Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We're all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. All right, what does God have to say to you tonight about how to win in the long run? My first point tonight, if you're a note taker, is that obedience is the key. Obedience is the key. The phrase, a long obedience in the same direction, is actually the title of a book written by Eugene Peterson. He's a, for, he's a pastor. He died a few years ago. And, and you would maybe know Eugene Peterson because he is also the author of the Bible paraphrase known as The Message. And Eugene Peterson, he died in 2018, a month before his 86th 
birthday. And up until the day that Eugene Peterson died, he faithfully followed God. He's, he's who I want to be when I'm in my 80s. And his book, Along Obedience in the Same Direction, it came out in 1980. But the way that he writes is, is like prophetic. And it just speaks so clearly to our day and age. I mean, long before there was social media doom scrolling and, and, and Netflix binge watching, he writes about how like the speed of our lives is what's making it so hard for us to obey God. Because we do today live in this age of like instant gratification, of microwaved meal prep, of Netflix binges and social media doom scrolling, of, of TikTok and IG reel and YouTube short content consumption. Like everything we do is like quick hit of dopamine and on to the next. That's how we are living our lives. But, but following Jesus, it requires patient endurance and perseverance over a long period of time, like over our whole lives. This is where Daniel really stands out as a model for us, a model of endurance and of perseverance a model of this long obedience in the same direction. In Daniel chapter six, Daniel is now in his late 80s and he has been in exile for almost 70 of those years. And the whole time he's been doing one thing and he's been doing it consistently, faithfully obeying God. I mean, look at the very last verse of chapter six, verse, verse 28. It says, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the summary statement of Daniel's whole life. He has lived through the reign of five different kings, Nebuchadnezzar II, Nebuchadnezzar III, Belshazzar, Darius, and now Cyrus. He's lived through exile in two different empires, the Babylonian Empire and now the Persian Empire. And he is still doing the same thing that he has always done, obey God. And you know, it, it wouldn't be a Danny sermon unless I was going to quote C.S. Lewis. And so here's what C.S. Lewis has to say about obedience. He says that obedience is the key that opens all doors. Feelings come or don't come and go as God pleases. In another work called Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis writes, Obedience is the road to freedom. Obedience is the key to winning in the long run. Obedience is the key to winning at high school. I'd argue that, that we want this like Rocky montage training version of faith because that fits the speed of our culture. It fits the speed of Babylon. But that's not how God operates. We are exiles, not natives to this culture. That's why we find obedience so hard. Obedience to God demands a slower pace than what we want to move at. Like we, we want our faith to feel right and feel good. We want worship songs that bring us to our knees and bring tears to our eyes. We want a microwave following Jesus into a quick hit of dopamine so we can keep on scrolling. But if you live your life in the spirit of God in that way, you will not be following Jesus when you are 28, 58, or 88. If you live your life in the spirit of God that way, you're gonna stay stuck. I said it earlier, following Jesus requires patient endurance and perseverance. These are characteristics that are only formed over a long and steady period of time. The New Testament authors actually speak really powerfully to this. Paul, the greatest missionary the world has ever seen, wrote this in Romans chapter 5. He said, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they will help us develop 
endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and strength of character is our confident hope of salvation. And James, the brother of Jesus, says this in James chapter 1, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Their insight is that the longer you live, the more trials you're going to face, the more tests of faith you are going to go through, and they can either break you or they can build endurance, the necessary ingredient to a long obedience in the same direction. Daniel, he faced trial after trial in Babylon, and it didn't break him. It produced endurance, the key to winning in the long run. So now if you're a note taker, I'm going to double dip on my second point tonight because I see two things that I think are, are really intertwined characteristics that are a result of Daniel's faithful obedience to God. And, and they're things that I think you can cultivate in your life as a high school student right now. So my second point tonight is integrity among people because of intimacy with God. Integrity among people because of intimacy with God. If you want to win in the long run, if you still want to be following Jesus when you're in your 80s, your obedience to God is directly linked to your intimacy with God. Right? Like, like this is so key. Your obedience to God is directly linked to your intimacy with God. And the result is people take notice. They see it. Intimacy with God, it means like a, a relational closeness. It means you know God's voice because you have spent so much time with him. And so if you want to start obeying God, I think a really good place to start would be to know what he wants you to do. And we discover the will of God as we read his word and as we pray. That's the example that Daniel sets for us. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. As usual, just as he had always done. Intimacy with God was the norm for Daniel. He prayed often and he knew God's voice. He knew how God wanted him to move in exile. His prayer times were so regular that even his enemies knew when they could catch him praying to God. He was so close to God that even under threat of death, he would not stop praying. Look at verses four and five. The other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Obedience and intimacy were linked for Daniel and it led to a reputation of integrity among people, even his enemies. Like they went searching for, for anything they could find to accuse Daniel of wrongdoing, but they literally could not find anything. Like zero skeletons in his closet. Obviously, we know Daniel was not perfect. He was still a sinner, just like you and me, but... But he was so obedient to God for such a long period of time that the result was a life marked by faithfulness and responsibility and trustworthiness. Here's why I draw those connections for us tonight. A lack of intimacy with God and a lack of integrity among people 
are barriers to you winning at high school. Winning requires a long obedience in the same direction and intimacy with God and integrity among people. That's how you're going to get there. I held up Eugene Peterson as an example of what I want to be like when I'm like 85 years old because he displayed deep intimacy with God all the way up to his death. And I have been so discouraged as I have seen story after story over the last few years of of church leaders, pastors, who have fallen away because of scandals or they have died and then sins, egregious sins have come to light and it's thrown their whole ministry into question. Like these people who were supposed to be leading churches lacked this integrity And I would bet all of my money, every single dollar that I make here, that it was because at some point down the line, their intimacy with God broke down. They stopped loving God. Their relationship with Jesus suffered and their lives started to slip. So if you want to win at high school, if you want to win in the long run, cultivate a life of intimacy that leads to a life of integrity. Here's how to start. Get in the word every single day. I've heard one pastor say, you need a time, a place, and a plan, right? Pick a time, same time, every single day. I would suggest first thing when you get up. Whatever's gonna be best for you, I think that's probably best actually for most people. First thing, get in the word. You need a place. Go find a place that's going to be like special where you read God's word. And my suggestion, not your bed. You will fall asleep, right? Time, place, and you need a plan. Like know what you're going to read before you get there. The Bible app has so many great reading plans. Seniors, I built you a plan for reading the whole Bible. If you're in foundations and if you want that, I can get that to you. Like have a plan when you go to read God's word. Number two, Make worship a daily rhythm. Make worship a daily rhythm. Worship is so much more than just singing songs when we're here on a Wednesday night. Your prayer life is worship. Tell God how amazing he is. Ask him to move in power in the situations that you are struggling with in your life. Confess your sins to him. Ask him to save and bring close the people in your life that are far away from him. Make worship a daily rhythm. Number three, stay in community. Be here on Wednesday nights. Participate in your small group. Depend on these people because God has given them to you. So often the wisdom of God comes from the people in our lives. Don't reject it. And I'll say this, community, it's deeper than just your friend group. Like my friends and I like say, we need some gray hair in our lives. Like go find some people who are older than you, who have been there and who have done that and let them speak into your life. Community with the people of God is more than just your friend group. Like your small group leaders are here because they are just enough ahead of you that they have lived more life than you and can speak to what you are going through right now. Stay in community. Number four, serve somewhere. Serve somewhere. Serve here in God's house on Sundays. Like go to the nursery and serve the many moms of this church by holding babies. Come and serve like families who have kids with special needs at the Barnabas respites and hang out with some kiddos who have special needs so that parents can go have a night off. Come serve with me in J High and disciple some middle school leaders. Come to camp this summer and be a counselor at J High summer camp. Serve somewhere because in serving people, we honor God. And number five, be bold and share the gospel. Be bold and share the gospel. I promise you, inviting other people into a relationship with Jesus is going to take a whole lot of boldness, but it cultivates a dependence on God like nothing else that you can possibly do. Who in your circle needs to know Jesus? 
How can you start praying for them now? Finding ways to care for them and then winning opportunities to share the love of Jesus with them and invite them into a relationship with God. Be bold and share the gospel. So as I close tonight, I just want to remind you that obedience is the key. It's the key to winning in the long run. And intimacy with God is going to lead to integrity among people. Winning at, middle, at high school is going to require a long obedience in the same direction. Daniel, he's such a great role model for us. I read, I read in my studies this week that Daniel's success was not the result of his faithfulness to God, but God's faithfulness to him. Daniel wasn't perfect. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't perfect. They're just modeling what it looks like to follow God in exile. And friends, we are living in exile. This world, this is not our home. But here is, here is the good news for you tonight. Jesus is the perfect Daniel. You and me, like we are quick to eat the food from the king's table and we are quick to bow down to idols. We are so prideful and it rips us away from God and we would rather do anything but be obedient to him so often in our lives, but not Jesus. Jesus is the perfect model of what it looks like to obey God. He passed every single test without wavering. He, he perfectly followed the will of God all the way up until death. He died to free you and to free me from the chains of sin. And he rose to new life so that you and me could finally have life. It's no longer about how well you follow God. You don't have to be perfectly obedient because Jesus was perfectly obedient on your behalf. His obedience counts for you if you will trust in Jesus. And so do not wait. Do not hesitate. Do not let anything come between you and that relationship with the God of the universe. He loves you. He created you. He died for you so that you can have life. He's going to help you win at high school. He's going to help you win at life when you're 88 years old. So let's pray.